Farron owns the weekend in Montgomery County. Shepard takes home six grand in Jersey. We take the white flag with an up-and-coming modified competitor. Matty D, take it easy. It's time for Race Pro Weekly. To another edition of Race Pro Weekly, I'm your host, Mike Warren. This past week was round number two of the Super Dirt Car Series as they headed to the New Egypt Speedway for the Dirty Jersey 2 in an event promoted by Stuart Friesen and Brett Deo. With Justin Harris grabbing the point lead in win number one at Brockville, who would come out on top in race number two? Big crowd on hand at the New Egypt Speedway as we would get ready for round two of the Super Dirt Car Series as Timmy McCready making an appearance. He would set fast time in the event as the green flag would drop with Jimmy Phelps and the Jersey Jet Brett Hearn getting the start by virtue of the redraw on the front row. Off of turn number two on lap number one, you'd see Timmy McCready split the 323 of Neil Williams and the 20 of Brett Hearn to get to the number two spot as cars jockeying for position. Jimmy Blewett on the outside lane trying to make his way up through the field. And now T-Mac would go to the outside of Jimmy Phelps. He would take the race lead just three laps into the event as he looked like he may be the car to beat in the early going. Billy Pouch would turn the wick up on the outside lane as he would look to crack the top five in the early going of this feature event as now the four of McCready having to deal with pressure from the 98H of Jimmy Phelps as they would continue to ride onto the racetrack, but a caution would slow them down as the 27J of Danny Johnson would have problems on the front end after spinning as that would end his night as he would pull into the pit area following the next restart. Speaking of that restart, it would put the 9H of Matt Shepard right on the back bumper of Timmy McCready with Billy Pouch trying to make his way up on the outside as he was in the top five. Shepard making a bid on the outside lane as McCready slides right up in front of him, and Jimmy Phelps trying to keep some momentum on the inside as well. Pouch right behind them once again as they slide down the back straightaway as they continue to fight for position, but it would be Pouch taking the race lead as he get by all three of them on that outside lane, and Timmy McCready still trying to push to the inside. Looks like he almost has him, but the drag race down into turn three will go to Billy Pouch once again as he was just powered into the ground on the outside lane looking like he would be the car to beat at the closing stages. However, Pouch would have problems on that number one machine as he would slow leading the race up into turn number one and two. Drive shaft problems going to stop the number one from winning the dirty jersey 60 as he would be taken off on the hook. Off the restart, Rick Laubach would make a push to the inside of Matt Shepard. They'd make contact off of turn number two. Shepard keeping the momentum, however, in the FX Caprera machine as he would fight through turn number three and four. And now on the last lap, Shepard would slide up just a little too much. Laubach with a great shot, but Shepard wins the drag race and would pick up the win in the Dirty Jersey 60. You know, my hat's off to Rick. He raised me real clean. Uh, you know, it was tough. Uh, you know, there was a lot of equal racing grooves out there, and I just didn't really know where I wanted to be. Um, you know, I knew I could get a good, good run off that top of two, but... At the same time, I was leaving the whole bottom of the track open, so I had to trust him to give me room, and he did. That was a hell of a race. I mean, the top four guys, I mean, that's, you're racing time trial laps for 60 laps with Pouch up there, and these guys, I mean, this is some fun racing. I wish there was some more down here with these guys because they race the way racing should be, you know what I mean? Super Matt Shepard grabs the win and the dirt car points lead. Rick Laubach would finish in second, Timmy McCready third, Brett Hearn fourth, and Billy Decker would round out your top five. In the Companion Turnpike 25 feature event for the 360 Sprint Cars, David Franick would grab the victory. Robbie Stillwagon would finish in second, Kyle Reinhardt third, Brian Carver fourth, and Kurt Michael fifth. Since Bobby Varon returned full-time at the Fonda Speedway this season in the Jake's Breaker-owned machine, he has yet to pick up a victory despite having the point lead by a narrow margin. Would this past Saturday night be the time he would break the winless streak? Justin Bowler and Josh Hohenforce going to lead the field to the green for the 30-lap modified feature at the track at Champions. The Apollo Rocket trying to make his way to the outside, trying to go two for two. As Bowler will come around to complete lap number one as your leader. Problems early on the Dover break, car number double zero of Danny Varon. 
Now it's old man Bobby Varon going to try to make his way up through the field as he gets to the outside of Jeff Trombley for position and tries to go to work on Brian Gleason as the caution comes out for Stuart Friesen, who tagged the wall hard up in turn number one and two. Off of the restart, Bowler would be your leader, but it would be Bodie Bellinger getting the great jump and taking the race lead, while A.J. Romano would sit into the number two spot as he would look to chase him through lap traffic. Bellinger gets by Friesen, who not normally a lap car at the Fonda Speedway or anywhere for that matter, as Darwin Green would stop. Off of the restart, a little bit of bumper tag as Rockefeller gets hooked up with Owen Forst and the 24 at Jeremy Wilder, as that will bring out the caution again here for just a split second. And then off of the restart, A.J. Romano tries to make a move to the inside on Bellinger for the race lead, but Bellinger going to battle right back to the inside. They race door to door off a of corner number four, and it will be Bodie Bellinger keeping the race lead at the line. Meanwhile, Romano tries to go to the outside as caution comes out for the 816 of Jeff Rockefeller once again as he would have to be towed off the racing surface with a lot of damage. Now off of that restart, it would be Romano making the bid to the outside and he has the bite. He would take the race lead down the back straightaway. Romano very familiar here with the surface at the track of champions as now Bobby Varon would go by Bellinger for second. Then he turned the wick up on the outside lane and he'd get the race lead. Bobby Varon would be your new race leader with just one lap to go. And you could bet Bobby Varon very happy to pick up win number one at the Fonda Speedway. AJ's a tough competitor. Week in, week out, uh, you got to look out for him. You know, he's, he's coming. He's on the hammer. So we got an opportunity uh, with all them cautions there at the end uh, to catch up to the field. And uh, I didn't know if there was going to be enough time, but I knew we had a good race car. And uh, it all worked out in the end. But uh, it, was a, it was a fine line. Had to drive it hard. Bobby Varon strikes with his first win at the Fonda Speedway. A.J. Romano would come up in second. Bodie Bellinger third. Brian Gleason fourth. And Alton Palmer would round out the top five. It's now time for this week's fan poll question. Do you like special midweek events at racetracks? Why or why not? To cast your answer, head to Facebook and Twitter on the Race Pro Weekly page, and your answers may be read on next week's show. Taking a look at the answers from last week's question, at your local racetrack, what is your favorite division that runs each and every week and why? Well, the answers came down. Nicole Jackson says the four cylinders because there's always a challenge for the win and it's just low budget people who want to have fun. Brian Fredo said the pro stocks, they always put on the best show. Sean Robertson says the modifieds, the moves they make at Merrillville really get my adrenaline flowing. Ted Schmidt says, real, true, IMCA-sanctioned modifieds at the Skyline Raceway. Gary Gaziano says, anything that shows up to race. Gary, I think we're all in agreement on that one at the end of the day. The action, the battles, the excitement. Get ready for 800 horsepower of ground-shaking racing. The Super Dirt Car Series Big Block Modifieds are coming to your town. Be there to witness the mighty Big Blocks. The Super Dirt Car Series Big Block Modifieds are returning to Utica Rome Speedway for the first time in more than 10 years. It's the Utica Rome 100 presented by Gates Cole Insurance. Be there to see the Big Blocks battle the legendary half mile. Wednesday, June 25th, Utica Rome Speedway, Vernon performance, quality, service. That's DMC Racing Products. Hundreds of name brand parts, competitive prices. That's DMC. DMC Racing Products, race to win. This past week, I got the chance to head down to the New Egypt Speedway along with a lot of Capital Region runners as they made their attempt to win the Dirty Jersey 62 feature event. The BBL team was down there of Brian Gleason and Matt Lorenzo, but did not have the night they were looking for as Brian Gleason had battery trouble before the night even started and Matt Lorenzo failed to qualify. Keith Flack also made his way down to the track as well as he ended up with a 27th place finish fighting the track throughout the entire night. One surprise at the Speedway, however, was Michael Sabia running a big block modified 
as he usually pilots a sportsman car at the Lebanon Valley Speedway on a Saturday night. There was also big news around the Capital Region this past weekend. It has been announced that Glenbridge Motorsports Park will now be running on Friday nights. Due to the change of nights, Dirt Car has officially dropped their sanction from the Speedway, and the July 16th Super Dirt Series race has been effectively canceled. Last weekend in Orange County, you saw Chuck McKee pick up the big block and small block feature event. With a chance at a twin bill with twin 20s on the horizon, could anybody do the same? Harry Shortway receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Orange County Fair Speedway as we would get it going with twin 20 number one as Billy Van Amwagen and Bob McGannon would lead the field to the green flag in the early going of this one. A lot of cars on the move early. Of course, the number one of Tim Heinley going to make his way to the inside as he would make his way past Mike Holka, Chris Schultz, and Hollywood Craig Mitchell running towards the front as well. Chuck McKee going to go on the outside of Tommy Meyer for position and set his sights on Clinton Mills as Jerry Higby would pull to the inside as well of the seven of Donnie Wilson as it would continue to run here in the early stages. Heinley would pull to the outside of Chris Schultz as he take a number four spot away down the back straight away and into turn number three and four. And there's Bob McGannon running strong, but the question is, where was Billy Van Imogen? Well, he was about a half a track ahead in the TEN machine as he was leading this one with a big advantage. Wilson and McKee fighting for position towards the front of the field, but it would be all Billy Van Imogen as he would take twin 20 number one down on the hard clay. Billy Van Imogen would grab the win in feature number one, Bob McGannon coming home in second, Craig Mitchell third, Tim Heinley fourth, and Chris Schultz fifth. While last week at Lebanon Valley showed a first-time winner in Kyle Hoffman, would it be time for some of the veterans to reclaim their throne at the top of the modified feature event? 30 lap modified feature event getting started at the Lebanon Valley Speedway with Eddie Marshall and Kyle Armstrong leading the field to the green. Kenny Tremont would make a bid for the number two spot as they come around and complete lap number one with Marshall as your race leader and Armstrong holding on to the spot for the time being as the field would make its way by. Tremont would slide to the inside of the Newtown Pools corner 11A off a of turn number two. So he would be your new second place man and set his sights on race leader Eddie Marshall. Brett Hearn and Donnie Corellis looking to make their way up through the field as they would have to come from deep on the grid. Meanwhile, Andy Bacchetti has caught the top three as he would go to the inside of Kyle Armstrong up into the east end and he would grab the number three spot away as we headed towards the closing stages of the feature event. J.R. Hefner and the A. Calaruso and Sons car number 74 was on the move as well as he'd get by the 11A of Armstrong for the number four spot and he wouldn't be done there as he would get by Andy Bacchetti on the back straightaway and slide in front of him to take the number three spot away as he would try to chase down Tremont and Marshall. Tremont doing everything he can but it just seemed to be the 98 was a little bit better off a of turn number two and that would be enough as Eddie Marshall gets win number one of 2014. We're fortunate uh, things went our way, way uh, starting up front, and no cautions, uh, uh, but it felt good and it ran good and, uh, you know, we're quite pleased and, uh, you know, next week we'll have our work cut out from the back, uh, uh, but it seemed like we had a, a better car, so uh, hopefully we turn the corner a little bit. Eddie Marshall gets his first win of the 2014 season, Kenny Tremont coming home in second, J.R. Hefner third, Andy Bacchetti fourth, and Kyle Armstrong would round out the top five. So far at the Ridge, defending champion Bobby Barron has found his way to the front three times already on the season and was looking to do it again. Was there anybody out there that could stop him from going back to back? Eric Mack and Chad Miller would lead the field to the green in the 35 lap modified feature event at Glen Ridge. Miller would make contact with Bobby Varon and Mark Johnson down the back straightaway in the early going, which allows Varon to get the spot. Now a battle for the lead would ensue as Corey Wilder would get on the back bumper of Eric Mack. Wilder would go to the outside lane as the caution would come out onto the speedway and off of the restart. Keep an eye on Bobby Varon on the outside lane. He'd take the number four spot away from Bobby Vetter and now go to work on Craig Hansen. Farron would dive to the inside trying to get by Hansen for third. He would get the spot and Eric Mack as he slides up the banking, which also has allowed Mark Johnson to get by him for spot number three. That would put Varon on the back bumper of Corey Wilder now as the race headed towards the closing stages. His caution would come out on the speedway for the 7-11M of Eric Mack in turn number four. 
That would put Varen to the inside of him, and it was almost like deja vu as Varen would get the jump up into turn number one and two, take the race lead as he would be well on his way to try to grab another one. Mark Johnson was sliding to the number two spot under, under the 21 a Wilder, and then Kenny Tremont would get to the inside of Greg Hansen as he would make his way up through the field. But this was all behind Bobby Varen once again as Johnson tried to get right by him but didn't have a chance or enough time as Varen strikes again with another win. Bobby Varen goes back to back for the second time this season at Glen Ridge. Mark Johnson would finish in second, Kenny Tremont third, Jamike Soul fourth, and Craig Hansen rounding out the top five. We're here today with Vinny Sanginetti. Vin, first I want to ask you a big change from last year to this year. How's this, how's this big block? How are you adjusting to this big block so far? It took a few weeks, but uh, I think we're starting to hit on some setups that you might have some promise and hope to, but uh, the track, track changes every week, so it's kind of tough to figure out what's going to happen. But take it one week at a time. You had a pretty good weekend here last week. You, you, you won a heat race here for the Lulazaro Memorial, took home 250 bucks. You got some lap money there. Give us a little bit of how that felt. Yeah, that felt really good. Uh, with the group of drivers that compete here in the Modifieds, especially in that heat race in particular, uh, I didn't foresee that finish happening, but uh, I was really happy it did. And especially on a night that we remembered your father, which is, it meant a lot to me. and. You know, something I'll always remember. Now, I want to ask you too, what is your your long-term goal for this season? Uh, stay consistent and uh, hopefully get more competitive as the season goes along. We started out a little rough, but every week seems to have something happen. Uh, last week, during the race around lap 24, we had something go through the radiator. So we lost uh, a lot of water and uh, forced to pull in. So if I can, Bringing home every week in one piece this year, I'd be happy with that. I'm gonna ask you an oddball question here. What, do you have any superstitions when it comes to race time? I can't can't say it's green, because you got green on your car, so that's not one. You got anything else, anything, a ritual that you do before the races every week? Well, honestly, it was green. Uh, I was kinda, <laughs> kinda forced into the green colors. Uh, but it's not that big of a deal. Uh, thanks to Tim Dietz and Thermal Control, for everything they've done for me, but wasn't ever a fan of green, but it's growing on me. Uh, as far as anything else, uh, my mother gives me a note that I keep in my pocket throughout the feature, and uh, usually on the one to go, I usually reach down and make sure I, I touch that, so. It's now time for our Berkshire County Network Driver Spotlight with Albany Saratoga Limited Sportsman competitor, Colin Bocas. Race Pro Weekly is brought to you by Racing Electronics, your number one source for professional race communications worldwide. Sheldon Oil Services, recycling for your future. Rainmaker Productions, co-promoters of the Lulazaro Memorial Race at Fonda Speedway. And by Pilot Graphic Designs, signs, banners, decals, and so much more. Give Dan a call today at 315-539-3484. The Eve of Destruction returns with a vengeance to Lemon and Valley Speedway Tuesday, June 24th. There's a metal massacre in the valley with rollover madness, trailer racing, and a full contact school bus race. The hired legendary thrillmaster Tim Chitwood and his band of lunatics to put the car in carnage with our wildest stunts ever. Everything destroyed! Let's see your video game do that! Gates open at 5, devastation at 6, Eva destruction, Lemon Valley Speedway, Tuesday, June 24th. This time we've gone too far! 
The Super Dirt Car Series Big Block Modifieds and the ESS Sprint Cars are returning to Rolling Wheels Raceway Park for the Stars and Stripes Summer Super Show. Presented by Dig Safely 811. Thursday, July 3rd. Kick off your holiday weekend with dirt track racing and a fireworks extravaganza. Kids 17 and under get in free. Get your tickets today at rollingwheelsraceway.com. It's fast cars and fireworks. Rolling Wheels Raceway Park, Route 5 L Bridge. There's only one place in the Capital Region for you to get the full racing action. Stop down at the Bobco Video Booth at the track or call 518-399-0937. Bobco Racing Video, the next best thing to being there. Street stock action at Orange County, and well, that lime green car got a little dirt and a little smoke. Not too good for his night. Twin 20 number two for the modified is going to be led to the green by Donnie Wilson as he's bringing up into turn number one and two for the first time. Chris Schultz and the Tornado, Tim Hindley on the move here in the early going in this feature event. Joining him would be Jerry Higby trying to make his way up along with Johnny Lito on the inside lane and Chuck McKee on the outside trying to turn up the wick as he go around turn number one and two. McKee would have trouble on the 19 machine, which is a tough break after picking up the win in both the big block and small block feature event a week ago. Off of the restart, the green would fly, and it would be Wilson taking the race lead as Tommy Meyer would now move into spot number two in that number 33 and a third with Tim Heinley right behind him in spot number three as they would get towards the later stages of this twin 20. Heinley would make a bit to the inside of the 33 and a third machine but could not get him down the back straightaway, and now Meyer with a move to try to get by on the inside lane, but nobody would be catching Donnie Wilson as he would pick up his first career win at the Orange County Fair Speedway. Donnie Wilson would take the win in this second Twin 20 feature event. Tommy Meyer would come home second, Tim Heinley third, Mike Kolka fourth, and Clinton Mills would round out the top five. Other winners on the night, Brian Crummel would grab the sportsman win once again. Matt Burke would get the win in the rookie sportsman. And the street stock winner would be the jalopy jet, Charlie Donald. Small block modified feature would get started as it would be Jim Royce and Jason Harrington leading the field to the green into the east end for the first time. It would be Harrington taking the race lead in the early going. You see Holden Dwyer and Flying Ryan Darcy on their way up through the field trying to pick up their first win of the 2014 season. All behind the Reifenberg Construction car number one of Jason Harrington. Chad Chazio would be on the move as he has been consistent in recent weeks along with the 45 of Wayne Jelly as he made his way up through the field as well on the outside. As you see Jelly go around the outside of Jim Royce as he would take position and try to set his sights towards the front of the field. Olden Dwyer would duck to the inside lane of the one of Jason Harrington off a of turn number four and show him something, but Harrington just too strong on the outside lane that time as he would continue to lead the race. As they continue to fight up into turn number one and two behind him, you had young Tyler Dipple making his first appearance at Lebanon Valley this season. He would be racing with Wayne Jelly up into the top five. He would go right underneath them. They'd make a little bit of contact off a of turn number two, but it would be Dipple grabbing the position and Frank Hoard the third getting by him. At the front, one last shot for Olden Dwyer in lap traffic, but it would be to no avail as Jason Harrington picks up win number one on the 2014 season. I saw Olden stick his nose underneath me a couple times and uh, I started losing traction on the top side here. I went to the bottom coming out of four. I don't I saw him block him a little bit, you know. Once I got to the bottom, I realized that the car was tightened up a little bit and uh, and had a lot more forward bite, and the, and the thing went on very well. Jason Harrington grabs the victory. Olden Dwyer with another top finish coming home in second. Ryan Darcy third. Tyler Dipple fourth. And Wayne Jelly would round out the top five. Other winners on the night in the sportsman division, it would be Alan Hotailing. In the pro stocks, Frank Twing. And our pure stock feature event winners would be Dan Cody, Scott Morris, and Lou Ganser. Pro Stock feature at the Fonda Speedway would get started as a lot of the cars trying to beat the 27 of Nick Stone. As you see Jim Normoyle trying to make his way to the lead early as Gus Hallner would spin bringing out the caution in the West End towing car number 715 machine. Off of the restart, it would be the seven machine of Normoil taking the race lead off a of turn number two with Kenny Gates looking to follow into the runner-up position. Chucky Dumbluski would be on the move along with Crazy Kenny Martin as he would battle to the inside. And here comes Nick Stone and Pete Broderson trying to make their presence known to get another victory at the track of champions. 
Cousin Luke Horning going to go to the inside of Walt Brownell. He'll take the position away as he tries to go up towards the front. As now it'll be the 27 as Stone getting out of shape, something you don't see every day right in front of Pete Broderson. As Hallner would spin again, bringing out the caution as that would bunch the field up. On the restart, Normoyle will keep the race lead, but it would be Kenny Gates sitting there in the number two spot. Right there behind him in third would be the two of Cousin Luke Horning as now Nick Stone tried to make his way into the top five once again. His hood starts to come off on the 27 machine as you see it about to pop through, and there it goes. Nick Stone's hood coming off of the racetrack, and a photographer very generously removing that off of the front stretch so we could continue racing at the track of champions. Meanwhile, Jim Normoyle going to look to take the race lead once again off the corner, and as they brought him down, he would pick up the win at the Fonda Speedway in the Pro Stock Division. Jim Normoyle picks up the victory in the Pro Stocks. Cousin Luke Horning would come home second, Kenny Gates third, Walt Brownell fourth, and crazy Kenny Martin would round out the top five. Other winners on the night, Dave Constantino goes back-to-back -back in the Sportsman. Street Stock feature event goes to Dave Horning Sr., and Keith Tessero Sr. would grab the win in the four cylinders. Twenty-five lap sportsman feature event at Glen Ridge would have the twenty-six of Derek McGrew as your race leader heading up into turn number one and two. Shay Montgomery on the outside of Kyle Dimitro for position as they would bunch up in the midway point of the field as guys like Chad Edwards and Mark Mortensen look to make their way up. And speaking of Mark Mortensen, he would spin up in turn number two as that would bring out the caution for the first time. Off the restart, it would be McGrew taking the race lead again as a car would slow off at turn number two with Lottie Hyanga sitting in the number two spot as that would bunch up the field once again as then here comes Shea Montgomery to the outside of John Miller. He would take the number three spot away going up into turn number one and two. Lottie Oyanga would slide up the banking a little bit and get into John Miller and that would cause a bumper tag effect as Curtis Hohenschel would spin collecting the 39 of Colin Bocas. Off the restart, Rocky Warner making his way up through the field as he would go to the inside of Chad Edwards and try to take that position away and he would do so as with McGrew leading, Montgomery would still sit in the number two spot and Justin Combs in third, but now turning the wick up would be Shea Montgomery on the outside. Montgomery would make his way around Derek McGrew and take the race lead. Now Rocky Warner would battle to the inside of Derek McGrew and then switch to the outside to get the position away as he would take the number two spot, and he was not going to catch Shea Montgomery, who picks up his first sportsman victory at the Glen Ridge Motorsports Park. Montgomery would pick up the victory. Finishing in second would be Rocky Warner. Third, Derek McGrew. Fourth, Justin Combs. And Chad Edwards would round out the top five. Other winners on the night would be Chucky Dumbluski in the Pro Stocks. In the Vintage Modifieds would be Daryl Holbert. In the XL 600 Modifieds would be Kyle Fallis. Slingshot feature event would go to Brett Putnam. And it would be Keith Tessero Sr. picking up the win in the four-cylinder feature event. It's now time to take a look at our weekend battles. At the Airborne Speedway up on the asphalt, it was Patrice McGrail grabbing the win. Leon Gagno coming home second, Todd Stone third, Chris Fernald fourth, and Chris Kayef rounding out your top five. Sail panels would be used down at the Bridgeport Speedway, and it would be the sensational one. Jimmy Horton picking up the victory, Ryan Watt coming home in second, Stan Frankenfield third, Wade Hendrickson fourth, and Matt Harrell fifth. At the Land of Legends, Super Matt Shepard with another big win with a full field behind him as the Hurricane comes in second, the Natural Dale Plank third, Matt Billings fourth, and Machine Gun Billy Dunn finishing fifth. Up at the Cornwall Motor Speedway, Chris Rabby picking up the victory, Dale Plank with another great run coming home second, and Stefan LaFranche keeping the momentum going as he gets another top five. Twin 20s would take to the Delaware International Speedway. Bobby Watkins would grab the win in feature number one. H.J. Bunting second, Bo Wilkins third, Jordan Watson fourth, and Jamie Mills fifth. Speaking of Jordan Watson, he would pick up the win in feature number two with Brad Trice coming home second, Bo Wilkins third, Michael White fourth, and Dale Hawkins rounding out your top five. At the five-mile point speedway, Anthony Perego does it again. Mike Colston coming home second. Tyler Seary third, Nick Petrolak fourth, and the Dreamweaver, Brian Weaver, coming home fifth. At the Fulton Speedway, the Franklin Flyer would get it done, beating out his teammate Larry White to finish in second. Bauer, Jimmy Phelpson, Adam Roberts with a great run, coming home in fifth. At the Grandview Speedway, Dwayne Howard would grab the victory, Mimi DeSantis coming home second, Jeff Strunk third, Kevin Herthler fourth, and Craig Von Doren fifth. At the Lernerville Speedway, it would be Dave Murdoch grabbing a victory, Rex King Jr. finishing second, Matt Williamson third, Jeremiah Shingledecker fourth, and Rex King fifth. 
at the Merrittville Speedway. Tommy Flanagan would grab the victory with Matt Williamson coming on second, Chad Chevalier third, Robbie Curl fourth, and Todd Gordon fifth. Down at Thunder Mountain, it would be Bob Ham grabbing the victory, Chad Cook second, Nick Rashinsky third, Mike Mahaney fourth, and Mike Clapperton fifth. At the Utica Rome Speedway, guess who? Stuart Friesen grabbing the victory with the Genoa Giant finishing second, Matt Shepard third, Mike Mahaney fourth, and Ryan Phelps fifth. At the Woodhull Raceway, it would be Stacy Jackson grabbing the victory, Josh Noberga finishing second, Billy Van Pelt third, Brian Doolittle fourth, and Bobby Davis rounding out the top five. The action, the battles, the excitement. Get ready for 800 horsepower of ground-shaking racing. The Super Dirt Car Series Big Block Modifieds are coming to your town. Be there to witness the mighty Big Blocks. The Super Dirt Car Series Big Block Modifieds invades Albany Saratoga Speedway to battle for 10000 to win at Brent Hearn's The Big Show 6. Presented by Recovery Sports Grills, Ferris Mowers, and VP Racing Fuels. Tuesday, July 8th, Albany Saratoga Speedway. The great race place. Make sure you check out the Thomas Racing Video booth and their website at www.thomasracingvideos.com. The Choices 301 program takes a multifaceted approach aimed at educating the public about the realities and dangers of what can happen when bad decisions are made inside a motor vehicle. Don't hesitate to designate. If you are a tracker series that would like to be highlighted on Race Pro Weekly, email us at show at raceproweekly.com. We take the white flag with an up-and-coming modified competitor. You're a newcomer to this oval track racing. Tell some people who may not know who Jeff Rockefeller is, how you got your start and why you started so late. Um, I had to wait for my dad to retire. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to wait for my dad to retire. No, uh... I don't know, we just, we've always wanted to do it, but instead when I was younger, when I was 16, we, I got into drag racing because it's a lot cheaper to drag race than it is to run circle track. There's really no maintenance on a car and you, you can rebuild an engine every six or seven years depending on how fast you want to go. So, you know, when my dad and I got, you know, talking, we are just like, let's, let's try circle track racing. So we tried it in 2011 and it, it's basically an adrenaline rush that you just, I don't think, no, nothing compares to it that I've found so far. Speaking of the highs and lows, last October certainly had to be a high for you and your team. You were one of the six fastest cars at the Moody Mile for Super Dirt Week. I still can't believe it. We still talk about it all the time that we were sixth or fourth quick there. And uh, it's still something that amazes us and we still have the car. The cars, we, we mothballed it and uh, matter of fact right now we're, uh, we took it all apart to do the maintenance on it like the transmission the steering box and the rear end and I just sent down the the engine down the Julian to have that freshened and uh, we're gonna come back with the exact same pieces we did last year and and hopefully we can duplicate what we did back in uh, 2013. Speaking of drag racing you said you got your start doing uh, the straight line racing is there anything that you were able to translate from drag racing into oval racing? No no I don't think so Looking back now, I mean, you, need, you, you, ha you have to have a good reaction time on the tree. Here you have to have a good reaction time every second of the lap. So, uh, you really, can, I, I, no, I don't think, you, you can't even really compare it. It's two completely different ends of racing. It's just, circle track is, is so fun, I can't even tell you. I, I mean, even on our bad nights, I still get out of the car smiling. I, I have such a great time, even if I finish last. I, and that's true to this day. If there was one driver uh, in the oval track world that you had to thank for helping you get where you are right now, who would that be? It's going to be two people. It's going to be Bobby Varon and Elmo Reckner. They, they're a phone call away. It doesn't matter what time of day I call them. They both answer the phone, and they both help me out. So I, I do know. Elmo and, and Varen have helped me out tremendously. Varen's actually t t has told me that, you know, I got to stop telling you stuff because now you're getting harder to pass. So, matter of fact, I just called him tonight and I asked him what I should do to this thing. And he goes, I don't think I want to tell you anymore. He goes, damn it, I have to. So he told me what to do. So I 
in, and I put his setup in this car tonight. So, and then Elmo's the same way. I talked to Elmo, and you know, surprisingly, their setups are pretty close to one another. So, I can rely. I can. I can. I can rely on both of those guys at any time, which I'm very thankful for. And and I don't think they've ever misled me in any way with with anything that they've ever told me or, or anything that I've ever asked. So. As we head into Father's Day weekend here, what would you say? Uh, what would you like to say to your father as a, a thank you for uh, helping you? Uh, I can't thank him enough. Both, uh, you know, with the car, the money end of it, the time, and he's just a great dad. You know, I don't know a lot of people know this, but you know, he served in the military, and I have a thing on the car that thank him, for, thanks him for that. And uh, I, I have, I have a great dad, and it's, it's awesome. It's now time for this week's NISCA Performer of the Week. And with his wins at the Fonda Speedway and the Glen Ridge Motorsports Park, who else but Bobby Varon is this week's recipient. Varon is now eligible for the NISCA Performer of the Year Award given out at the end of the season. That's all for this week's show. For the latest news, results, and photos, check out RacePro Weekly online, www.raceproweekly.com, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So for myself, Matt Knowles, Fast Eddie, Scott Morlock, Amber Chalmers, Dave Del Sandro, and everyone that helps put Race Pro Weekly together, thank you for watching this week's episode, and we'll see you next time.